Welcome to Grace, Hope, Love, the broadcast ministry of Calvary Chapel Birmingham in beautiful Alabama. I am so glad you've chosen to join us as we explore the Bible verse by verse and chapter by chapter. Through this ministry, we are reaching thousands around the world with the amazing, exciting, and life-changing Word of God. To learn more about Calvary Chapel Birmingham and God's plan for your life, or how you can partner with this ministry, go to calvarybirmingham.com. Today, God has an extra special message just for you. So grab a cup of coffee, pull up a comfy chair, open your Bible, and let's dig in. For your enter- entertainment purposes. All right. A lot of kids missing, but they'll be here soon. Yes. So what do we do when we wake up? We thank the Lord for his blessings. So we're going to sing this song, and I love this song, In the Morning When We Rise. Oh, this world 
we wake up we give thanks to the Lord we say Lord give us Jesus but then it becomes a happy day right guys all right let's sing a happy day do you want to stand up for this next one yep everyone stand up
that you have saved me. And oh, what a glorious day. What, what a glorious day. Through you the blind will see, through you the mute will sing, through you the dead will rise, through you my heart will pray, through you the darkness flees, through you my heart screams, I am free. Let's try that again. Through you. Through you the blind will see, through you the mute will sing, through you the dead will rise, through you my heart will pray, through you the darkness flee, through you my heart screams, I am free. I says, I am free. Okay. I am free to run. I am free to dance. I am free I am free. I am free. Woo. Okay, guys, you can. Through you the blind will see. Through you the mute will sing. Through you the dead will rise. Through you our hearts will praise. Through you the darkness flees. Through you our hearts screams. I am free. I am free. I am free. I am free to dance. I am free to live for you. I am free. Can we do that again, Mr. Yeah. Noel? Let's just let them sing. How about okay. that? I am. Let's do that again, but let's shout let's it really loud, as loud as you can. I am free. I am free. God loves us and he wants us to have fun, right? And that's why we sing. We sing to the Lord. Amen? He made instruments, or he gave us the ability to make instruments and play them. So we thank God for that and for singing. He made all things for his purpose, for good, right? Remember, kids?
Anything that God gives us, we can use it for good or for bad. It doesn't matter what it is. We use it for good or for bad. So anything that we do. Let's, let's get together and pray before we start the regular service. Hope Love, the broadcast ministry of Calvary Chapel, Birmingham, in beautiful Alabama. I am so glad you've chosen to join us as we explore the Bible verse by verse and chapter by chapter. Through this ministry, we are reaching thousands around the world with the amazing, exciting, and life-changing Word of God. To learn more about Calvary Chapel, Birmingham, and God's plan for your life, or how you can partner with this ministry, go to calvarybirmingham.com. Today, God has an extra special message just for you. So grab a cup of coffee, pull up a comfy chair, open your Bible, and let's dig in. Love 
heaven endures forever For the life that's been reborn His love endures forever Sing praise Sing praise Sing praise Sing praise Sing praise Set inside, His love endures forever. But the grace of God we will carry on. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. together this gathering of worshipers and believers we love you lord we love your name and we ask that with with these songs we can praise you we can sing out our hearts to you like a love song would because you loved us first above all Powers. Above all powers, 
in all created things. Of all wisdom and all the ways of man. We were here before the world began. For our kingdoms, for our kingdoms, for our thrones, for our wonders, the world has said. Trampled on the ground, you took the fall. You thought of me above Just as I am. Forgiven 
so that I can forgive. Here I stand, knowing that I'm your desire, sanctified by glory. Come, Lord Jesus, come. 
precious is it? And oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as the blood of Jesus and nothing but the blood of Jesus Pastor Sean asked us to play one more song. This is Give Me Jesus in the Morning When We Rise. And so the message will be along these lines. In the morning when I in the morning when I rise in the morning when I rise give me Jesus in the morning in the morning when I rise in the morning when I the morning when I rise, give me a When I am alone, and when I am alone, and when I am alone, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, give me Give us Jesus. 
Lord, give us Jesus. Give us Jesus. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us. Lord, we thank you. We praise your name. We ask that the book of Acts, that it may speak to us in chapter 4 today. We thank you for your love and your grace. Anybody who needs prayer, uh, we ask that they come forward at some point and let each other, the body, pray for them. We're all hurting in some way, and we know somebody that's hurting, and we need to focus on God's love for each other and for others. In Jesus' name. Everybody say hi to the Viking shirt guy. <laughs> the Viking guy shirt. You gonna do an announcement? Yeah, that's fine. You gonna do an announcement? Who are you talking to? Were you talking to Judith when you said that? Yes, Judith. Oh. All right, so we're going to continue our verse-by-verse -verse study this morning. We're going to be in the book of Acts in chapter 4. We didn't quite finish it out last week, so we are going to spend today finishing out chapter 4. Before we do that, I do have a few announcements, and then... Um, a video that we'll watch uh, regards to the persecuted church. Today is the uh, day of prayer for the persecuted church around the world. So we're going to take some time uh, this morning to um, lift up prayers for the church. And just a reminder, I'm reminding myself here to mute the phone. If you got a phone, mute it so it doesn't ring while we're in service, possibly disturb or distract somebody. And kids, the, the word for the day is church. The theme word for the day is church. All right, a couple of announcements before we get started. Every Thursday morning at 6 a.m., a group of us guys meet at the Chick-fil-A on Lakeshore at Wildwood. That's at 6 o'clock a.m. and generally lasts about an hour or so. I think some of the guys hang out after that for a little while longer. Everybody is welcome. We'd love to see you there. We 
take some time to, to enjoy a meal together, as well as to dig into the Word, and it's just a great way to start your day. So again, uh, guys, if you want to meet us there, 6 a.m., that's the Chick-fil-A on Lakeshore at, at Wildwood Center. Um, also, the Operation Christmas Child Processing Center trip, that is coming up soon. That is Saturday, December 7th. And for more details about that, you can contact Bethany. You can also go to the uh, church webpage, the website, calvarybirmingham.com. And there will be a link there to direct you to the Facebook event page for, for this. So, um, and you can find out more information there as well. Again, that is Saturday, or, yeah, Saturday December 7th. Um, and after Agape, after our Agape Feast on November 10th, um, we will have a packing party in which we'll take all the stuff that, that everybody has been donating over the course of the last year, um, and we will assemble those together in some shoe boxes. Um, so we've got lots of stuff, so it uh, should be a good time. Speaking of the Agape Feast, that is Sunday, November 10th, so next Sunday is the Agape Feast. We'll also take communion that same day. The theme <laughs> cuisine, the theme cuisine for the Agape Feast this month is Indian food. Now, that's not India like India Indian food. We're talking about Native American Indian food. So um, I, I'm not exactly sure what, what that would be. This was Todd's idea. Um, so you can, you can go to him. He's, he's part, uh, a lot of things, part Cherokee, um, Navajo, Anasazi, and Weebolo, I believe. So you can, you can get with him, and I'm sure he's got plenty of ideas uh, regarding the food that you can bring to that. Um, You'll be amazed. Oh, that's, wow, that's bad. Wow. Also, every Tuesday, every Tuesday morning at, 6 a, at 6.30 a.m., we meet outside of the Planned Parenthood. That's in, in the Highland area. Uh, we meet outside for, for prayer, um, and uh, it's, it's also a great time for us to fellowship before the, the morning gets started, but uh, we do take a stand against abortion, and that's one of the ways in which we take a stand by uh, taking a physical presence out there in the morning, on Tuesday morning, and prayer. Speaking of that, uh, 40 Days for Life, the 40 Days for Life campaign is kind of wrapping up right now, and I believe, is it today? Is the Jericho March at 2 o'clock? You're sure about that? <laughs> okay. Uh, what? Andrew knows. Okay, so, so two, 2 o'clock. Oh, he's the one that told you. Oh, that's, that's great. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, that's, that's good then. All right, so. <laughs> oh, goodness. All right, so, so 2 o'clock. I can see how this morning is going to go. So 2 o'clock this afternoon is the Jericho March. And basically what that is is, is we, we assemble with these, a lot of other churches. The people are going to be there as well. Um, and we assemble together with, with those people, and we spend some time marching around, uh, seven times around uh, the block of the Planned Parenthood Center there in prayer. Um, so, again, that is at 2 o'clock today, um, outside of Planned Parenthood. Uh, and that is at Highland. It's off of, if you know where Highland Avenue is, in 27th Place uh, South. Um, it's, it's right there. You can get there from, <coughs> from Nyazuma as well. So it's pretty easy to get to, and, and it's a... Um, a safe area of town to be marching around in and all of that. So, all right, let's see, what else? Third Saturday of this month is our monthly show and tell the world. You can join us as we go door to door to share the love of Jesus. We meet here at the church at 9.45 a.m., and we will head out from here at 10 a.m. So as I mentioned, today is the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. Um, and along those lines, I'd like to, to show you a video. Um, so go ahead and roll that. Every day throughout South Asia, believers face many kinds of opposition for their faith in Jesus. National missionaries and their families are often the ones who suffer the greatest for sharing the love of Christ with those in need. Persecution in some regions takes the form of imprisonment separating families for years. Before his recent release, this pastor spent the last eight years of his life in prison. Yes, my daughter was very small then. She was only 10 months old when I was imprisoned. Although my wife and I both went through very testing moments in life, she remained faithful to the Lord. 
she never thought of quitting on me. But because of these eight years of absence, my daughter sees me as a stranger. I was not able to be a father to her all those years. Ever since my husband was jailed, life was never the same. We had to go through lots of struggle. I would spend the night crying with many tears. I could not stop crying for the loneliness and pain of separation from my husband. My time in prison was not in vain. I was able to spend time in prayer and reading the Bible. I had determined that whether I am going to get released from prison or not, I am going to tell people about Jesus. I am going to tell the inmates about Jesus Christ. By the time I was released from prison, there were over 50 inmates who came to Christ or met regularly for worship. I am encouraged by Paul's letter to the Romans, where he says, What can separate us from the love of Christ? Can trouble, distress, persecution, hunger? The Lord taught me to come to him in patience and persistence in times of trouble. Our area mission leader and the local church stood with us through their prayers and support. They would visit my wife and encourage her, giving her assurance about my release. Not only the leaders and the local pastor, but also the believers from our church helped my wife and daughter with their needs. Also in South Asia, this pastor was sentenced to prison for showing a film on the life of Jesus and leading people to Christ. His recent release came after spending the last three years separated from his wife and young daughter. I had a call from the Lord and I was feeling it rather quite strongly. The Lord was asking me to go to some other interior places of my nation and share the gospel to the people. It is very difficult to share the gospel in my nation. If they find out that I am sharing about Jesus Christ to the people, the village authorities can take severe and harsh action for sharing the gospel. It was very painful to be jailed for three years and be separated from my family and child. If we cry over our losses and hurts, we will not move ahead. We will not see God's doings and miracles. We should rejoice in the times of persecution and trials. It is a responsibility and duty of a wife to encourage her husband to fulfill his call from the Lord. I must pray for him and encourage him to serve the Lord faithfully. God is sovereign, and I accepted my suffering in prison for my Lord's sake. Jesus had to go through beatings, humiliation, and death. My suffering was nothing compared to the pain and agony that our Lord went through. I thank God because it was only for three years. It could have been much longer. There are many prisoners in the jail who are serving life terms. There is no hope for them to ever come out of the prison and hear about Jesus Christ. I thank the Lord for sending me to the jail because so far there has been no single individual who had ever gone to the prison in my country and shared the gospel to the prisoners. As you already know, this is a very special day set apart for us to enter into the suffering, the pain, the agony of multiplied millions of the people of God in many nations who are going through incredible suffering, persecution for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The day of prayer for the persecuted church. Now you have seen it. Only an example of what is going on in so many nations. Kind of help me to remember what Jesus said in the Gospel of Matthew. He said, I was in prison. You came to see me. I was naked and you clothed me. And I had no one you cared for me. You see, my brothers and sisters, we are commanded in Hebrews chapter 13 to enter into the pain, the suffering of these people as though we ourselves are chained to their wrist in prison, in their beating and suffering. Please, may we not only understand what's going on, be aware about it, like you just been made aware of through the suffering of these dear brothers for the sake of Christ. Let us take time to pray, to fast, and then ask the Holy Spirit to give us a sense of their pain that we will become those people who will stand in the gap and pray and earnestly pray and do all we can 
for the suffering church. Thank you for doing it. So I find it remarkable that on this day uh, when we are going to be speaking about the beginning of persecution in the church in Acts 4, that today would be the same day as the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. Um, and what I'd like to do, Todd, could you do me a favor? Could you pass these around? Each one of these cards has a different area of the world, like this one is Israel, where the church is facing persecution. Um, if you would, please just take this home with you. Maybe place it uh, on a wall or on your refrigerator, somewhere that, that you see, maybe on the mirror, your bathroom mirror or something, somewhere that you see on a daily basis. And let this be a reminder to you to lift up that particular area in the world in prayer. There is greater persecution, although we may not, uh, we may not realize it, because a lot of it is hidden and not, we don't see it in the media. We see so many other things in the media, yet we, we don't see uh, per Christian persecution so much in the media. Yet persecution in, in Christian martyrdom is uh, greater now than it ha ever has been. Um, there are, you've probably heard some reports about Christians in Syria and the Christians in Egypt, the Coptic Christians there who are suffering so greatly. But there's also many other places in the world uh, where they are persecuted as well. And let's not forget that, that with every day, it seems like the church here in America draws nearer and nearer to a time of persecution. So let's also remember to lift up the church here, that the Lord would do a refining work um, in the church in America, um, a, a redemptive work even, as so many uh, need to repent and need to uh, turn back to the Lord. So let's take a moment to, to pray. Lord, we thank you, Father, uh, that, that you grant the church, the privilege of suffering for your name. Lord, even so, we ask that you would give Christians around the world courage. Lord, we don't ask that, that you um, eliminate persecution, Lord, but we ask that you give uh, Christians the courage and the grace to be able to speak your word boldly in the midst of persecution. Lord, we lift up those Christians in Syria, those Christians in, in Egypt, those Christians in Iran, and those Christians all around the Middle East, where we lift up the Christians in, in various areas of Russia and, and those in China. Lord, we lift up those in Africa, certain areas of Africa, Lord. And we, we just ask that you would uh, grant them protection. But Lord, also that you would increase their voice. Lord, that the persecution that they're suffering would just amplify the gospel. Lord, we ask the same thing for us. Father, we see clearly on a day-to-day -day basis that things in this country are turning more and more toward persecuting Christians and persecuting the church. And Lord, we, we don't necessarily ask that you stop that, but Lord, that us as well, that you embolden us through it. And Father, that you amplify your gospel through it and that you would be glorified by us through it. Lord, that many would see, that many would hear, and that many would repent and would turn to you. Lord, we place before you today the leaders of this nation. We ask that you would change the hearts of those who, who are making decisions that, that uh, go against your word. 
Lord, we ask that you would place alongside them godly men and women who can speak into their lives. Lord, we ask that you change their hearts. We ask, Father, that, the, that this country, from the top down, would repent and turn to you. Lord, we want to see revival in this country. Of course, that revival is going to have to start in the church. So we ask, Lord, for revival in the church. Lord, we place all these things before you, and we look forward to digging into your word together this morning. Lord, open our hearts to your word. Open your word to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Fantastic. There's lots of other things up there on that table as well. Uh, bulletins. Todd, can you see if anybody needs a bulletin? I, there's still a bunch of bulletins over there. Um, other things. There's some cards up there if you would like to take some with you to use for, in, <coughs> excuse me, for inviting people. There's also out here on the uh, children's ministry desk, there's some Operation Christmas Child items, some uh, decals and things you can place on your car. Um, you kids may be interested. There's some uh, little tattoos out there you can get as well. Um, you adults may be interested. <laughs> there's some little tattoos you can get out there as well. They're not iron-on, though. That would hurt. <laughs> Use water. All right. So we're going to be in Acts chapter 4 this morning. Teaching application verse is Romans chapter 15, starting with verse 5. It says, now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Leonard Ravenhill once said, if a Christian is not having tribulation in the world, there's something wrong. And John Stott, he, he once quipped, persecution is simply the clash between two irre irreconcilable value systems. This morning, we're going to continue to, to look at, at the persecution of the church, observing in, in Scripture the response of this first church to the threats of the religious leaders. We'll talk about prayer. We'll talk about praying the Scriptures. We're going to talk about spiritual warfare. We're going to be talking about persecution and our right response to persecution, how to glorify God through persecution, and even more. First, let's, let's take a moment to review so we remember where we left off last week. Last week, the Lord brought us to an amazing message of redemption, of resurrection, of empowerment, unity. And we continue along those same themes today. We, we did not finish out that chapter last week. Instead, ending with the religious council of Jerusalem, also known as the Sanhedrin, threatening the apostles. See, Peter and John had, through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, Peter and John had healed a man who had been lame since birth. They healed him in the name of Jesus. And then used the attention that the healing brought to teach the gospel. A message which affirms the resurrection of the dead. That message brought the doctrine of the most powerful religious group of that day, the Sadducees, into question. Because they did not believe in the afterlife or in the resurrection of the dead. This man's healing and, and his, his boisterous reaction, his boisterous response to being healed, it drew a lot of attention from the people that were there in the Temple Mount. A lot of people came to see what was going on, and a lot of those people knew that man, knew he had been lame since birth, and recognized that an incredible miracle had been done. And so if this miracle had been done through the Holy Spirit using Peter and John, then those things that they were teaching then probably had dramatic effect on the people that gathered around. And this was a threat to the Sadducees. Again, it, it, it was totally opposite of what their doctrine was. 
And so it would have placed question in the people's mind as to the doctrine of the Sadducees. And of course, that would have been dangerous for the power that the Sadducees had. And so at the order of the religious leaders, the, the temple guards arrested Peter and John, as well as the healed man, and they held them overnight for the council to question them in the morning. Now, so powerful had the testimony of this healing and the message of redemption been that an additional couple of thousand people believed, and the church grew to over 5,000. That next day, the council, unable to take any course of action because of what the people had seen, you know, the, the, the healing had been seen by apparently many thousands of people, so they couldn't take any action against Peter and John. And because word about the healing had also spread throughout Jerusalem, the council, all they could do really was threaten the apostles and threaten the church to try to discourage them from speaking of Jesus or teaching any longer in the name of Jesus. The response of the apostles to this was bold. They said earlier in this chapter, they said, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, judge for yourselves. For we cannot help telling the things which we saw and heard. Now, their response was really quite instructive to us today. You see, the apostles and the church were respectful of authority, recognizing that the authority of the Jewish council did come from God yet also recognizing that with God there is no contradiction. And so they point out to the council that rather than acting on behalf of God, the council was placing themselves at odds with God, and the church must then choose to obey God over the council. Now this is a timely message for us because today we find our own government more and more at odds with God. The most liberal government that we've ever had is also the most controlling government that we've ever had. Looking at those who are in various offices and will likely continue to, to ascend in their positions, I, I don't see many who have any appearance in their life of, of true godliness. I mean, we can look at the legislation that's being passed and the things that are going through the courts, and, and the way that, that, that lawsuits are being pursued against churches, against Christians who are just trying to hold to their biblical values. Those who pursue that kind of stuff, we, we can't say that they have godly values. We have to look at the fruit. You know, they, they may call themselves Christians, they may even appear to be Christians. But if they're fruit, and it's very easy to tell what the fruit of somebody who's in the government is because you can look at how they vote. I don't see many who have any appearance of godliness on either side. Every day we find more and more evidence of, of government trying to legislate what can be said. In some cases, they legislate what can even be thought. There's a day coming when biblical values will be considered hate, not just by those individual citizens who have set themselves against God, but the government will enact laws seeking to close the mouths of those who teach righteousness and who are unwilling to compromise the gospel. Now, personally, I believe that time is quickly approaching. And I also believe that the church must recognize this so that we are prepared. I believe that we're, we're catching glimpses now of things that, that have really been going on for a long time just hidden from our view, such as the, the NSA spying on citizens, collecting large quantities of, of data about all of us. You know, I've said this before, but I think that that data will be used at some point to try and blackmail Christians into being quiet about their faith. The Bible says in Romans 13 that God institutes all authority. And so we should be very careful when our words or our actions speak or go against authority. But when human authority chooses wickedness and commands us to set aside the authority and command of God, we must then choose God over that wicked authority. When that time comes, there's not going to be a question in you of what should be done. 
Because you will, you will be told to speak falsehood over things of truth. You will be told to favor evil over good. To favor the world over God. And I believe that there is none saved who will be able to make that kind of compromise. Because to the saved, the word of God is life and nothing less. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are headed for destruction. But we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. I know what God has said and I know what the world says. And my friends, the two are right now not compatible. I also know God's track record. I know that his track record is impeccable, while the track record of the world, which I've seen as well, is reprehensible. So I must then choose what God has said over the world. In the last week, we've talked about how persecution weeds out the pretenders, while at the same time solidifying believers. This is something that I believe is soon on the horizon for the church in this nation. And so I'm glad that it is God's will this morning that we should be able to study this chapter together, where the reality of opposition and the possibility of persecution is going to be presented by the apostles to the church. I think there's much we can learn for ourselves this morning in their response. So we pick it up this morning with verse 23 of Acts chapter 4. Which says, and being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. Who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. Peter and John, they have been released, and they went back to their own companions. That that would be, of course, the church. And they told them what had happened, as well as what had been said. Again, because the... Because of the realities that individual Christians and the church face today, we need to pay very close attention with this first church. These first Christians who are under the leadership of those who Jesus personally discipled, we need to pay close attention to what they did in response to a threat against any continued teaching or actions done in the name of Jesus. And would they form a militia? Would they take up arms? Would they just roll over? There's no question that there is warfare going on today and that there will be casualties from that warfare, just as there was no doubt in the minds of these early Christians that what was happening was serious and could result in unpleasant physical consequences. For them, as well as their families, if they continued to teach, speak, and act in the name of Jesus there could be consequences. The Bible does not hide this from us, but it does paint, it does point out that while sin and rebellion against God has a physical expression that can result in the physical harm of Christians, of those who stand for God, those who stand for righteousness, the forces behind all these things that we're talking about, these are spiritual forces. The Bible makes it clear that we're not fighting against flesh and blood, But as Ephesians 6.12 says, we're fighting against evil rulers, authorities of the unseen world, mighty powers in the dark world, evil spirits in the heavenly places. And since we battle spiritual forces, the weapons that we have been given, that that we are expected to take up, are themselves spiritual in nature. And because the physical is the fleshing out of the spiritual, The most effective weapons are those that bring spiritual results. In 2 Corinthians 10, the Bible says of our war that it is not according to the flesh. 
And the Bible says of our weapons that they are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. When that verse says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, the Greek word that is used there is sarkikos. That word literally means having a nature of flesh. Now in scripture, the flesh is described as being sinful, weak, flawed, and perishing. And the works of the flesh are the same. And so when the Bible says that our weapons are not carnal, it means our weapons are not weak and not prone to failure. In fact, our weapons are not even of this world. They are spiritual, having been given to us by God, and their power is the power of the Holy Spirit. This is why the Bible speaks of the spiritual weapons that we have been given as being incredibly powerful against the forces of evil. In fact, in a spiritual battle, there is no material weapon that will afford any kind of victory. Only the spiritual weapons can be effective. Now, Ephesians 6 describes those weapons, and we talked about them this past Wednesday evening as we studied through Numbers 10. So I'm not going to spend much time to accept other than just to name them out for you. It's the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and prayer. Now, all of these are, we might look at most of these and, and immediately think, well, these are defensive weapons. Except for, of course, the sword of the Spirit, and, and prayer is an offensive weapon as well. Though the other elements, they, they, we may see them as being defensive weapons, they can have an offensive nature to them in the case of, of extreme physical or spiritual warfare, right? Either way, for, for defense or, or for offense, all of these things are important tools in spiritual warfare. Now, if you want to learn more about these weapons of our warfare, I encourage you to go back and listen to Wednesday's teaching. In Numbers 10, you can do that at calvarybirmingham.com. Now, one thing we should notice about these weapons is that none of, none of them are from ourselves, but all of those are given to us by God. So there's a little bit, that's a little bit about the weapons of warfare, but we need to talk a little bit more about the nature of spiritual warfare. What does it look like? Is it, is it fisticuffs, uh, bruises, and, and blood, or is it something else? You know, we need to know so, so, that when we, so that when it comes, we can recognize it. First, it's good to recognize that spiritual warfare, or physical warfare, is itself rooted in spiritual warfare. We will never face an obstacle, we will never face a temptation, or even a physical attack that is not spiritual at its roots. But spiritual warfare does not always surface in a physical result. Spiritual warfare could be expressed in mental anguish. It could be expressed in depression or anxiety. Maybe in temptations. Those temptations that we're confronted with on, probably on a daily basis. You know, these and other things we often try and manage through medications or, or even through psychology when they actually may be better resolved by taking up the weapons that God has given us. Yet if we refuse to recognize the reality of spiritual warfare, we will, of course, neglect our weapons. Now, the Bible is clear that the spiritual realm is very real, and if we refuse to believe that, then we're choosing to disbelieve God because God is the one who has told us that the spiritual realm is real. Our disbelief, it doesn't change the fact or negate the reality of spiritual warfare, it just makes us more likely to be a victim of it. Now, spiritual warfare is, much like all warfare, composed of smaller battles, skirmishes, dust-ups, and such. And every one of us is, is involved in spiritual warfare, whether we admit it or not. If we will wear the armor, and if we will sharpen and wield those weapons, we will find ourselves victorious and often. But we're not completed works. We are being completed. We are being perfected. We are being renewed. And there will be times when we find ourselves defeated by, by temptation or by fear or by doubt. 
or some other of Satan's wicked tricks. When that happens, we should be reminded that defeat does not mean destruction. For there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And defeat does not mean rejection. Satan would love for us to think that we are rejected because of some moral failure. But God makes it clear in 1 John 1, 9, God makes it clear that if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. These are some of the good words for those who are willing to go to battle. Because those who are willing to fight, those who place themselves on the front lines, they will fall. At some point or another, there will be a stumble. But perhaps the best word is that which we take into battle. And what word is better before the fight than that which reminds, that reminds us that our enemy only has the power that we are willing to give to him? Colossians 2, 14 through 15 says he canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. See, spiritual warfare, it can be a scary thing. It's scary to think about, it's scary to, complicate, to contemplate. Yet it is a reality that we face every day, oftentimes without even realizing it. Now, given that fact, I myself find great comfort in the word that Paul brought to us in Romans 8. Where he says, And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither fears, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Nor even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing and all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, understanding that there is spiritual warfare, and that there is growing opposition to Jesus in this nation, and that the persecution which the church has experienced and is experiencing many places around the world may well be soon coming to America, it's very important for us to recognize and pay very close attention to what this first church, under the leadership of the apostles, did when confronted with opposition and persecution. I find it remarkable and challenging that the church at that time did not plot some kind of uprising in order to overthrow the religious leaders. I, I believe that they certainly could have been somewhat effective in doing that. I mean, think about it. 5,000 people had suddenly become this church. That was not something that was invisible to the rest of Jerusalem. I think it would have been very easy for them to take advantage of, of the buzz that was going around Jerusalem about what was happening to stir up the people to go against the religious leaders. I mean, we read here, the religious leaders, they felt threatened by what was going on. They didn't feel threatened for nothing. They knew that this new movement was a threat to their power, and that is why they threatened the church. So when Peter and John arrived back to their, their own, to the church, we might have expected there to be calls for taking up arms and taking preemptive action against these religious leaders. Yet we see that is not what happened. What did they do? They all together raised their voice to God. Now this does not mean that every person all 5,000 people at the same time started praying out loud. That would have been just a whole lot of confusion. What happened was that one of the apostles, probably Peter, after telling the people what had happened to them, lifted up his voice to the Lord, and they were all in agreement in prayer. Now, prayer is of utmost importance, yet it is often neglected. Prayer faces us toward his, towards our king, and is the means by which we align our hearts with his will. It redirects our focus. It reminds us of who we are in Christ. It emboldens us. It strengthens us. It refreshes us. Now, we mentioned prayer as being one of the items in the armor of God. Praying, prayer is not something that comes only at the beginning of a battle. 
Prayer should run the course of combat, just as a squad of soldiers does all they can to maintain communication with headquarters during battle. One of the most important things to do in combat is to preserve lines of communication. So then one of the best things to do to the enemy is to cut their lines of communication. I think that Satan has convinced many Christians that prayer is for church, for before meals, and before going to bed. That is why there are so many unprepared Christians when spiritual battles start. Prayer is not only a line of communication, it's our supply line as well. Especially when prayer is paired up with Bible study. A a troop in the heat of battle may, may not stand in battle long once the supply line has been cut off. And what degree of of insanity would it take for a soldier in the heat of battle to cut off his own supply line? Yet how many Christians enter a struggle with not even a second thought to prayer? And how many Christians consider opening their Bibles a last resort? The Christian who does that either wants to fall, is enamored with the struggle, or has become confused over who is the Lord in their life. Now, the first thing we need to notice here is what is said in verse 24. That is, Lord, you are God. That's something a lot of people today don't seem to know or don't want to recognize. Even many Christians seem to live in denial of God's lordship. So many Christians today seem to define their hope by what the government is doing, or in some cases, what the government's not doing. Proverbs 3 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Psalm 100 says, know that the Lord is God. Nowhere does the Bible say faith is to be placed on anything or anyone except the Lord. So faith placed elsewhere is, according to God, misplaced faith. I find it very interesting that, that just a few verses before Paul wrote in Romans 13 about the submission of believers uh, to government, in chapter 12, He wrote in verse 14, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. In verse 17 of chapter 12, repay no one evil for evil. In verse 19, dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge, I will pay them back, says the Lord. In verse 21, don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil By doing good. The proper response when authority shirks its responsibility to God, but instead goes against God, is not to rise up in violence, but to continue in good things, doing what God has told you to do, not compromising and not wounding your own conscience while being willing to endure punishment from government. For God appoints authorities for a purpose, and God allows hardships and He allows suffering. For a purpose, and when we are willing to abide in His purpose, He is glorified, and the schemes of darkness are cast down. The Bible outlines for us several ways in which believers are to respond to evil. It says, "Avoid it." Paul puts it pretty plainly in 1 Thessalonians 5, saying, "Abstain from every form of evil." Psalm 1:1 says, "Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly." nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Second way to respond to evil is to hate it. Psalm 97 says that to love the Lord is to hate evil. That doesn't mean we hate people, but as you've probably heard, love the person, hate the sin. Proverbs 8.13 says the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogance in the evil way and the perverse mouth I hate. Third, third way to respond is to rebuke it. In Matthew 16, Jesus rebuked Peter by saying, Get behind me, Satan. And that wasn't because Peter was Satan, or Peter was possessed by Satan. Instead, it was because by contradicting what Jesus said about his coming death, Peter was tempting Jesus to go against the Father's will. Fourth way is to resist it. James wrote that if we submit to God (coughs) and resist the devil, he will flee from us. 
fifth way is to repay it with good. When we respond to evil with good, we usurp its power and we remove its venom. Luke 6.35 says, Love your enemies, do good, and lend, hoping for nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the unthankful and evil. A sixth way is to pray. Pray in response to evil. God is always willing and always working. Prayers of faith don't always ask for help. Sometimes they acknowledge help. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. A seventh way is to trust God. My favorite scripture about trusting God is Psalm 23. You guys know that, which Psalm 23, where, where the, our shepherd leads us to, to these great places of, of cool waters and fresh grasses, but then also to the valley of the shadow of death. In both places, he's our shepherd. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Let's reread verse 25 and 26 here. It says, again, this is part of their prayer where they're, they're praying scripture. It says, Who by the mouth of your servant David have said, Why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. Let's keep going. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. There are two things I want to address here. First, the power of praying scripture. And second, the scripture that is featured in this prayer. Now, using scripture is a very powerful means of prayer. But it's also one that has been kind of maligned or discounted by those who misunderstand it as being formulaic or who write it off as being vain repetition. Now, I'm telling you this morning, that is not the case, and there are great benefits in praying Scripture. First, praying Scripture is it's edifying, not just to the person praying, but also for those who are, are being prayed for, those who are hearing the prayer. You know, praying Scripture can bring comfort and peace to those who are afraid or who are hurting. It can remind us to be satisfied when we're lacking. And it can solidify faith in our hearts. Especially in times when we can't get our eyes off the problem. To pray scripture, obviously you need to know scripture. And to know scripture, you need to cultivate a commitment to study and memorize scripture. Now in Acts 17, God tells us that he considers those who read, who study, and who learn his word to be noble. Now, noble means someone of high class, high social class, high morality, courage, and generosity. In other words, God has a high opinion of someone who has a high opinion of his word. In the book of Genesis, we find that God created everything with his word. And the power and sufficiency of his word it hasn't changed since that time. God still tells us that his word is living and powerful, that it's active, that it's sharp, that it's alive. And Jesus, whom the Bible says is the living word sent by God, Jesus himself said in John 6 that the words that he speaks are spirit and life. God makes us a promise in Isaiah that his word will not return void. And God says in 2 Timothy that his word will guide, instruct, correct, and thoroughly equip us. In Romans, Paul tells us that scriptures give us hope, patience, and comfort. And in 1 Timothy, God says his word will keep us morally pure. I think we've all seen how when we are in the midst of, how when we are the most in God's word, when we're spending that time studying God's word, when we have our devotion time, when we're in church hearing teachings, when we're worshiping, when we're just in his word, wholeheartedly, I think we have all seen that in those times 
we find ourselves the most settled and established in our walk with Christ. There can be no doubt that God's word in our lives is an overwhelmingly powerful and effective force, even to life and death. Proverbs 18.21 says the tongue can bring death or life. Those who love to talk will reap the consequences. In James, we are told of the great power that our tongues wield through the words that we speak, and that a salt water spring will not bring forth fresh water. We have a great responsibility as ministers of grace not to speak anything that does not edify or minister grace which means grace is a commodity that we need to tuck away in our hearts, and we do that by the infilling of God's Word. So now that we have that foundation established, are there any other benefits to praying God's Word? Well, one one might argue, well, why should we pray using Scripture, God knows what He said? Do we need to remind him of what he said? And so why pray it back to him? Well, in Jeremiah, God says that he is watching over his word to perform it. And 2 Peter says that God has given us great and precious promises, promises that enable us to share his divine nature, as 2 Peter 4 says, and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. To put it plainly, God honors his word, and when we pray his word, We partake in his divine will. In other words, we pray in agreement with him. Matthew 18, verses 19 through 20, Jesus said, I'll also tell you this, if two of you agree here on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. For where two or three gather together as my followers, I am there among them. Now, I may agree with you, you may agree with me, but how much better if we are in agreement together with God in prayer. Praying scripture can assure that our prayers are in agreement with Him, except for in the case where we pray something, pray some scripture completely out of context. God's Word works in us. His Word changes us. Praying His Word is not an attempt to to talk Him into doing something but it's taking hold of his willingness. And of course, to pray scriptures requires that you know scripture. And remember, we're not talking about vain repetition. How can praying God's word ever be vain? Now back to our scripture this morning. This prayer of the the apostle Peter here, with the church in agreement, this prayer is quoting from Psalm 2, verses 1 and 2. This is very important to our understanding of the text and the teaching this morning. So let's let's take a look at this psalm. In verse 1 of of Psalm 2, which is the same as verse 25 of our current chapter, the nations are the Gentiles, the goyim. The word for nations and the word for Gentiles is the same word in Hebrew. It's goyim. So the verse could be read, why did the Gentiles rage? And the next line of Psalm 2, which is still verse 25 of our current chapter, the people are la'om in Hebrew, the people are the Jews. And we have that conjunction between the two statements telling us that there is something that has joined the Gentiles and the Jews together in outrage. Not just outrage, but the Hebrew word reek, which means vain, empty, or foolish outrage. An outrage that accomplishes nothing. In verse 2 of Psalm 2, speaks of the Melech Eretz, the kings or the great powers of the world. These are the powers in the principalities of darkness, the powers of the unseen world. These powers, they yasav, they set themselves, meaning they took their stand. The Razan, or the judicial leaders, the judicial rulers, referring to the the ruling human authorities and religious leaders, they yasad, meaning they teamed up or joined together in agreement 
with those forces of darkness. And so together they were set against Yahweh, against his Mashiach Yeshua, or Messiah Jesus. They, like all of mankind, are also plotting against themselves, heeding their own counsel for a common cause. That cause is to come against Yahweh and his Messiah. Now what was not included by Peter in praying the scripture is the next verse in the, st in the stanza of Psalm 2. And of course, in that day and age, the Jewish people, they, they spent great time memorizing scripture. And they would have known. I mean, Psalms is the, is the, the song book, the worship book of, of the Jewish people. They would have been very familiar with Psalm 2. And so there was a method of teaching in that time in which a portion of scripture would be spoken and then the part that wasn't spoken would still be understood to be a part of the teaching. It would, in other words, it would bring it to mind, like if I said, row, row, row your boat right now, you guys are thinking merrily down the stream. Right? You, you know this, you have it memorized, and that one line brings, brings to your memory these other things. And so in this case, the unspoken part of the scripture passage is important for us to talk about because while it is not written here in Acts 4, it is certainly implied in his prayer. Now that verse, Psalm 2 verse 3, it says, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. So what is it then that the Gentiles, the Jews, the forces of darkness, and the human rulers all came together in agreement to do? to rebel against the Lord and reject his lordship, to exalt their own desires over the truth of God. Whew, boy, that sure sounds like today, doesn't it? That should sound very familiar. I mean, think of the removal of the Bible from schools and as well as courts and other civil institutions. I mean, so many places where the Bible has been forcibly removed from view because it disagrees with what man wants to do, and it's then considered offensive. You know, this, this idea of the separation of church and state. And you don't find that in any official document drafted at the founding of the United States. It's not there. You can look and look all you want. You won't find it. It was taken from a letter written by Thomas Jefferson to a church. And why was he writing then to a church? Well, he was writing to the church to assure that the state would keep out. <laughs> it had nothing to do with the church staying out of government. But of course, it has been used to remove God from public view. Prayer from schools. Do you know the Bible was the original textbook in schools? Now you might get sent to the principal's office if you brought one. Army chaplains are, are limited in what they can talk about. How and when they can use the name of Jesus. You know, primetime television programs say Christians are insipid, stupid, gullible, cruel, heartless, while portraying non-Christians as tolerant and loving. Churches have started teaching from books other than the Bible or watering down the message by ignoring important things like sin, death, blood, the cross. After all, those things can be quite offensive. There has been a self-created famine in this land. It's a famine of the Word of God. It's a famine of the nourishment that we receive from the Word of God, of its benefits and its blessings. It's a famine of wisdom and a famine of reason, where weeds of sin and vanity have been allowed to push out the good plants. This nation is, is a moral and spiritual mess, and our elected government representatives, more often than not, shake their fists at God and rage against his word. And, of course, they remain in office year after year, which is a sure reflection of the stance this nation is taking against the Lord. Any diminishing of the role of Scripture is the exalting of man and man's knowledge. It's a choice to set aside truth in preference for deception. 
Christians should not be surprised because this nation has done all it can to turn her back on God. And for the most part, Christians have simply watched it happen. Sometimes even voting against their better judgment. Voting against what they know they should vote for. Because they have been deceived, we have been deceived, into thinking that voting your faith is ignorant. You know, we're, we are in the midst of, of a self-created famine, just as Amos 8 speaks of. I'm afraid that this famine of the word is the result of the exaltation of man over God, even in the lives of many Christians. It amazes me how many Christians have no devotion time and prayer time of their own. It also amazes me how many Christians have no real commitment to attending church. Going to church is not something you do when it's convenient. It's a commitment you make and then you stick with it, whether it's convenient or comfortable or not. There are a lot of Christians today who neglect fundamental aspects of following Jesus, and they, frankly, they walk around weak and ineffective because of it. Think of in the life of, of Daniel, how he, he preferred to spend a night with hungry lions than to miss a day of prayer. I doubt that the vast majority of today's Christians would be found with Daniel in that den. Jesus himself said that when the salt has lost its flavor, it should just be, be then tossed out and used as gravel. But you know, I'm not going to give up on this nation. I won't give up on this nation. I believe that there is still time for this nation to turn back to God, to turn our backs on evil. And that's going to take a spiritual revolution first in the churches of this nation, and then out into the land. Like in the time when, of King Josiah in 2 Kings 22, when the word of God had been so neglected that it had been lost in the temple. When it was rediscovered, it was there in the temple. Then when it was once again taught in the temple, we see that the idols are removed from the temple as well as from the land. We see then that abortion was done away with. There was a great revival, and there was a revolution in the whole kingdom. So I have a lot of hope for revival in this nation. But whether that happens or not, I know that God remains on his throne, and I know that he is sovereign over all. Now back to our text, what's happening here is a change, or what's interesting here for us is a change in verb form. I know this gets a little specific, but a change in verb form that we see between Psalm 2 and what is used, what Peter prays here in our chapter today. There's a very simple single word that changes verb form. It's the word do. Do. It has changed to did. In the Hebrew scriptures of Psalm, the word is do, referring to a present state. In Acts 4, the word is did, referring to the past. You see, we find out in verse 27 why the verb tense was changed. Peter is praying this verse, referring to the scheming of Herod, Pilate, the Gentiles, and the people of Israel against Jesus. But their counsel and their scheming was just vanity because they were playing into the hands of God. In fact, Psalm 2 highlights the vanity of their schemes against God in verse 4, saying, He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. So Peter, in using the past tense, reminds us that God is in control. And the cross was not a defeat, but was in fact a victory. At the cross, Satan was soundly defeated, and he knows it. So now his desire is to hide that fact however he can and glorify himself over God. Verse 29. Now, Lord, look on their threats. This is continuing that prayer. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of God 
of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. I love this. Such a lesson here for me, probably for you guys too. We see in their prayer that they recognize that the Lord is God and that he is in sovereign control. They acknowledge the state of the world, the attitude of the world toward God and his Messiah, Jesus, and that Christians were in the minority. They recognized who they are to God. They are God's servants. The Greek word doulos is used here. It's a bondservant or a servant out of love. And finally, they recognized the threats against them. And instead of, of praying for an end to the threats, they pray for boldness to speak God's word and to walk in the power of God through the threats. How many of us here would, would pray to God or pray for God to put an end to the threats or even to protect us from the threats? I know I would. Yet they pray that they would continue to glorify God in the threats by speaking boldly and by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You know, many times we may recognize that there is opposition to the gospel, and we even recognize that there is a day coming when we will face threats of criminal accusation or even violence and persecution. And so we ask God, we ask that God would defeat, circumvent, or, or put down, or somehow not allow the opposition or persecution <coughs> to happen so that we can freely proclaim the gospel. Yet that's not what they did here. In fact, you almost get the sense that they rejoiced in the persecution and considered it a privilege to suffer for the name of Jesus. That God may be glorified by them through this persecution. I think that is an attitude that better glorifies the Lord because it demonstrates both submission to His, His will and it demonstrates suppression of self-will. To be a bondservant of the Lord Most High is to have nothing to fear because God is greater than anything the world can do to us. Now I want, I want us to pause a moment here and talk about something that is empowering and essential to us as the church, as the body of Christ. We see well illustrated here that God responds to prayer that is offered in agreement among the brethren. Now we talked about pray, praying scripture, which is praying in agreement with God, but we see here also that while just one prayed, their voice was one accord. And they were all of the same spirit and attitude. And what one prayed in agreement with God, they all lifted up in agreement and unity with one another. In our chapter today, we have two groups who are acting in agreement. This is very interesting. Two groups we see that are acting in agreement. And so we also see a, there's a contrast between those two groups. We have the apostles and the church, and they are praying and acting in agreement with one another and with God. And then we have the dark spiritual powers, the kings, the nations, the rulers, and the peoples. Basically, the world, and they are also acting in agreement with one another. This emphasizes for us a commandment that we see repeated through Scripture. It's one we see in Deuteronomy 6.5, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. No person can serve two masters, Jesus would later say. You will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. We cannot give God our whole heart if any percentage of it has been given to something else. Now, agreement is being of one mind with others, and it, it, can, be, it can be both for good purposes as well as for evil purposes, as we've in this morning have pictured in these two groups in our chapter. 
Now, because agreement is being of one mind, agreement cannot be made with both light and darkness at the same time. God himself is not divided, but he is one, united within the three persons of the Godhead. 1 John 1, 5 through 7 says, This is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you. God is light, and there is no darkness in him at all. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. But if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Agreement among believers is commended in Scripture as a means of enhancing unity and peace and building up the people of God. And so it, it only makes sense then that we should seek agreement with other brothers and sisters in Christ and, and divide only with those who divide themselves from Scripture. As an example, I, I recently reread a statement from Pastor Chuck from 2006 when he addressed uh, Calvary Chapel's position on the emergent church movement. In that letter, he reminded pastors that they themselves were responsible to Jesus, who is the chief shepherd, and that they themselves will ultimately answer to him for their ministry. And since the emergent church divides itself from God's word in several ways, such as condoning sinful lifestyles or softening what the Bible teaches about hell, or teaching that Jesus is not the only way, we cannot be in agreement in any way, shape, or form with the emergent movement. But where there is agreement on the teachings of Scripture, we can be in union and agreement, even where there are stylistic differences. Perhaps one worships with no music at all, another worships with a full band, Perhaps one speaks in tongues and the other doesn't. That's the kinds of things that should never cause division in the body of Christ. And when it does, it plays into the strategy of Satan to weaken the church. Satan has two very powerful weapons that he has used very successfully because they play so well to our flesh and to our pride. We've talked about this one weapon quite a bit, especially in the past couple of weeks, and that weapon is doubt. Satan has sidelined and derailed many Christians by introducing doubt. And that is a weapon Satan used even at the beginning, even at the beginning of time, causing Adam and Eve to doubt, to doubt the clear instruction of God. The other weapon of Satan, and the one we're going to focus on here for a couple of minutes, is the wedge. Now, if you've ever split firewood, you've probably used a wedge. You know, first you introduce a, a small split in the wood, and then you position the, that metal wedge in the split, and then with some other force hitting that, that wedge down, pressing that wedge down into the log, the log is split neatly in two. The wedge is extremely effective. It requires only a little pressure to keep driving it down. It can work quickly, like with an axe or, or some other, maybe one of those machines, those wood splitting machines. But it can also work slow. You know, think about drops of water slowly dripping down over time. It can cause a whole cliff to break off. You know, it can undermine the foundation of, of a very sturdy building. With a wedge, Satan can divide churches. He can divide friends. He can divide marriages. And he can do it slow enough that we don't even notice it happening. And remember that God doesn't just call us to come together to sing and enjoy teachings together. But Hebrews 10.24 says, Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. The New Living Translation puts it this way, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. We're not, to only, we're, not, we're, we're not only to enjoy one another's company, but we are to exhort, we are to encourage, we are to provoke one another to better things in Christ. 
Sometimes we have to correct one another. And we should be willing to do that. And sometimes we have to receive correction. Sometimes we have to serve, and sometimes we must be willing to be served. We defeat the wedge of Satan by continuing in fellowship according to the abundant grace of God, which is something we'll talk a little bit more here in just a second. Verse 33, we'll head towards the end here. And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there any, anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed, and they distributed to, each as, to each as anyone had need. And, Jesus, and, excuse me, and Joseph, who was also named Barnabas, this is our first introduction to Barnabas, by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. The power with which the apostles gave testimony to the resurrection of Christ was the result of the attitude of this early church. You see, agreement in the church is a powerful thing, but it is also a tenuous thing. And so agreement between believers requires mutual dependence on grace. First, we have to recognize our own dependence on the grace of God. Acknowledging that dependence, recognizing that self-sufficiency and self-reliance will be met by God with grace enough to humble our pride. We also have to recognize that our brothers and sisters in Christ are also dependent on the grace of God. God is good. And the grace he gives to his children is abundant. Unity and agreement based in, in his abundant grace is powerful enough to proclaim tidings of glad news even in persecution. James 4, 6 says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Those who think they are strong enough to be Christians will find themselves deflated enough to follow Jesus. An inflated Christian will share a deflated gospel. But a deflated Christian will abound in the grace of the gospel. If we are to be in agreement with God, we must be in agreement with him about our need for his continued grace in our lives. It's not by law, but by grace that we meet with and walk with the Lord and it is by grace that we need every day to continue to walk with the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this morning. Lord, and we thank you for speaking to us in regards to persecution and, and how we respond to evil. Lord, there may be those here right now who are undergoing intense spiritual warfare. Lord, there may be those here that will be going through intense spiritual warfare. Lord, we pray that they would glorify you through it. Lord, that they would press into you. That they would take up those weapons. That they would put on the armor. Lord, that they would fight not under their own power, but under grace. Lord, we place ourselves before you. We kneel before you. You are our king. We give you this week, this month, this year. Lord, we ask you to do incredible things through us. Lord, we do lift up this nation. Lord, and we, we do have hope, Lord, that, that you are going to bring revival. Lord, we ask that you would allow us to play at least a small part in that. Father, there, 
maybe those here this morning or those who are watching the live feed or will be listening to this podcast later, and they've never received Jesus as their Lord and their Savior. But right now, they're feeling that tug. Your Holy Spirit is working on them, convicting them of sin and and revealing to them the emptiness that they have without you. Lord, you are the God of second chances. You're the God of third chances, fourth, fifth, and sixth chances. You're a God of grace. You're a God of mercy and a God of love. Your word says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So, Father, if there are those here this morning, if there are those listening or watching who have never received you as Lord and Savior, or maybe they've backslidden, they just need to recommit their life to you. Lord, I pray that you would move them to do that right now. And if that's you, dear my friend, please don't put it off. Please don't put it off. If that's you, then please pray along with me. Prayer is simply speaking to God. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So pray along with me. Pray, dear Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And I have sinned. Please forgive me for my sins. Thank you that you rose from the dead in three days, declaring victory. Lord, we ask that you would bring us victory in our lives as well. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, I thank you for any Thank you for all who have prayed that prayer. Lord, again, we, we place ourselves before you this week and ask that you strengthen us and prepare us for whatever battles may lay ahead. Lord, we don't look ahead with dread. We look ahead with hope, with joy, because we know how it ends. and We are victorious in you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face and his light to shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his shalom, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. That's Jesus, our Lord, our Messiah, our Savior, and everyone said, Amen. So God bless you guys. We'll continue with Acts chapter 5 next week. And of course, midweek service is at 7 o'clock. On Wednesdays, and we are continuing our verse-by-verse study through the book of Numbers. I believe we'll be uh, finishing up chapter 10 and maybe moving into 11. God bless you guys. Have a great week. Hi, I'm Pastor Sean, and I want to thank you for spending this time with us learning from the Bible about God's amazing love for you and I. I hope you've been blessed by this and also challenged by today's teaching. I want to ask a favor of you. This broadcast is reaching so many with the gospel, but we cannot do it without your help. Broadcasting costs money, and it could be that God wants to use you to help us continue this ministry. We don't have anything to send to you in return other than our sincere and heartfelt thanks for partnering with us to take the gospel to the world. If you can give 10, 50, 50, maybe $100 or more, it sure would help us to continue this work of faith. You can make your donation online at calvaryburmingham.com backslash partner, or you can mail it to Calvary Chapel, Birmingham, Care of Grace, Love, Hope, 225, Oxmoor Circle, Suite 801, Homewood, Alabama, 35209. Thank you so much for partnering with us, and may the Lord bless you.